Hello and welcome to Baseball Barbacast, the only baseball podcast in the world with not one, but two wife guys. I'm Jake Mintz. That's Jordan Schusterman. And I'm Mary Carpenter. Welcome. Welcome, 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 Jake, to the other side of life. It's not really that different, but it is pretty freaking cool as you all heard and probably saw on our various social media channels. Jake Mintz is now a married man as of uh, Sunday, September 8th, 2024. Uh, I was there. I was lucky enough to be in attendance. Thank you so much for inviting me and asking me to do a couple things (laughs) along the way. Um, It was a great time. The whole weekend was wonderful. But now that you are back... Uh, you know, I got to record a pod on, on Wednesday and then, you know, I've been remained immersed in the MLB world. But now you're back on the grid. Now you're a few days removed. You are back home at your desk. Um, how are you? How are you, is, I, we, have to re, we can recap some of the wedding, but like it, it went well, right? Like I felt like it went well. Did you feel like it went well? Because that's way more important. Yeah, I felt like it went really well. Um, I have nothing to base it off of because it's mm. my only marriage. Sure. And so. You know, going to a wedding and getting married are very different experiences. <laughs> duh. Right. But yes. Yeah. And just quickly from a baseball front. Oh, sure. When I don't know what I was expecting to see in the world of baseball during the wedding process. Right. Because when we're we have busy points in our lives all the time where we're going on a trip or we're out of town or I'm like going hiking or something. Right. And various nuggets of news infiltrate that force field uh, and make their way into my brain. But dude, like nothing, absolutely nothing on wedding day, like zero. Like I remember getting into bed the the next day or waking up the next day and like checking the scores and be like, no idea who won, (laughs) not a clue. And there is both bliss in that and a horror where now I wake up on Friday the 13th woo, and don't really know what's going on. But thankfully, Jordan is going to hold my hand and walk me through the madness. Sure. Yeah. And and honestly, I I mean, maybe this is a, a, a letdown for you and you were hoping it would be a, you know, a trade deadline esque reveal, but really not a ton uh, that you missed. Of course, there is game action that that unfolded that, that I'm sure was compelling. And I know you did watch last night and we're going to get to talk about uh, the Kamar Rocker debut, which you did uh, actually take in a good amount of but i would say like big picture there were some glimpses of interesting like oh wait are we gonna have a race in the american league uh a couple nights ago when the mariners and tigers and red Sox all won um it was like okay maybe these teams can make it interesting but really the story as as we have we talked about at the beginning of the month all right what race are we actually going to have the mets postseason odds for the first time all season surpassed the braves and that was and and now over the past week or so even as the mets tied them they were still behind atlanta because of their schedule but now i think and i assume this is still true as of this morning uh, the Mets uh, are now more likely, uh, according to fan graphs, to reach the postseason. And so I think the Mets are really the team we should focus on. But there were a couple other big things. I mean, Jason Dominguez is playing for the Yankees now. We, we were pretty much expecting that. Uh, he came up, Ver- Verdugo gave some very professional quotes being like, yeah, I don't, I don't whatever. Of course, if, if it's going to cost me playing time, so be it. Like, <laughs> Verdugo's as like. As long <laughs> as it helps this ball of course, club right. win. Like, I don't. What did you expect him? And he's probably like, great. Like, uh, I have a few fewer times to, you know, go over three. That's awesome. That's that's fine with me. Um, now he now listen. Of course, Verdugo. Then I think homered in like the first game that Dominguez Amazing. was playing, and then everyone's like, yes. see, look what lighting a fire under him. It's like, all right, sure, whatever. But uh, the more the the more relevant thing with the Yankees is that Aaron Judge still has not homered. Now the longest homerless drought of his career. We last wow. recorded. Uh, a week ago, when we delivered one of our favorite segments of the season, you know, recapping Aaron Judge's appearance on Rebel and Crew. And uh, listen, I mean, he said it himself. His lucky bat shattered. Speedmeister came in with a two-seamer. And even though he muscled that one out of the yard, whatever bat he's using now is is just not working. I know the Yankees still beat the Red Sox last night, and, and they're still doing pretty well as the Orioles have scuffled. That's another thing you missed. Didn't really want to bring that up, uh, <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah, they, you know, Aaron Judge is uh, not not being awesome. He's still at fifty one home runs. So I think we can all agree 
the judge's cold stretch is a direct result of going on yeah. the children's television program. I mean, that's yeah. I don't have any. We can talk it. causation correlation, but really it is science, mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. Your wife is a scientist. You know, my yeah. sister, the scientist, and, yeah. and I've consulted with both of them and they all agree. Okay. Yeah. So how do we kind of fix that? Mm. How do we push back against that energy? I think I have a solution, Jordan. I think we need to send Aaron Judge on the raciest, raunchiest Ooh, okay. television yeah. program possible yes. okay. <laughs> to counteract the juvenile, innocent oh. energy of Rubble mm. and Friends. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Yes, Rubble and Crew. Uh, yeah, no, that's totally... I, I, I thought you were going to suggest him just going back on the show, on the same show, and kind of finding some sort of narrative that can get him back in, in the mix. Um, but no, I kind of like, I kind of like what you're, what you're saying now, again, it would not be very Aaron judge of him to do this and it would kind of reek of desperation and a lack of trust in his own abilities. So in that sense, it would also be very not Yankees, right? Like it would, it would be a, a quite an extreme measure. However, it is very funny. So I'm glad you are bringing it up. Aaron judge's agent. Or is like we need to get Aaron on Euphoria stat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure we could get. I'm sure we could get Ron than that. <laughs> but I'm well. I'm not watch Euphoria, so maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but either way, I, it would be that he he probably needs to to do something. I know the Yankees are are doing just fine. Um, and and I'll I'm just gonna say, oh yeah, go go ahead. Wet hot American Judge. There you go. That's much better. Yeah, I, I'll just say though, he's gonna he's uh just. That our MVP discussion a couple weeks ago, I'm just, <laughs> just saying, there's, as you said, there is still time. There is still time again for him to hit a bunch more home runs. However, 60 is not looking especially likely. And um, Bobby Witt continues to play awesome and the Royals are looking good to make the playoffs. So I even John Heyman uh, said the other day, like, I think this is a toss up. I'm like, all right, interesting. So I would like to apologize and admit some level of fault. I was the person who said that I could not foresee a scenario where Aaron Judge forfeited his MVP race lead to Bobby Witt Jr. Now, I stand by the improbability of the longest homerless stretch of Aaron Judge's career yeah, for sure. popping up seconds <laughs> after I uttered I those words. That is a bad bounce. Yeah, However, 100%. you were that right. Is what I was wrong. Occurred. That is what I, I have. I'm not right yet. I'm just saying it's trending towards uh, an old takes uh, old take being exposed right now is an old take being mentioned. Uh, it could soon become an old take. <laughs> old take considered. <laughs> old take considered. So that's the Yankees. But I do think that. And then the only other main thing that you miss is, is Bowden well, Francis almost I wanna, no hitter again. Yeah. Was there anything I else in the Yankees? One more Yankees thing. Oh, sure. I, I want to okay. offer some sympathy to Alex Verdugo. Okay. Oh, okay. Baseball players are, they have good lives. Like, it's a good setup, okay? Mm -hmm. I think we all agree. It's pretty no, good. Oh, for sure. I think so, yeah. However, imagine you're not doing your job very well for a stretch, for one reason or another. Happens to all of us. And there are millions of people saying that a younger person should have your job. And every day, when you walk into work, you are being asked about that over and over and over again. And then they bring that guy to stand next to you all the time at your office. That cannot be easy or fun. Now, yes, it is worth the calculus of making millions of dollars and getting to be on the Yankees. And it is part of the job. We would all make that trade. No doubt. All of us would. That being said, I, in my little heart, maybe I'm overly empathetic. I feel a bit for Alex Verdugo. He's not walking up there trying to stink, yeah. right? He, he That's not what he wants. Yeah. And yet he has to answer to it specifically. Like, I just, could you imagine, Jordan, if we had a bad podcast and someone was like, man, get these college <laughs> kids up here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, and the other thing is like, Alex Rudy is going to keep playing. I know Yankees fans are like, oh, that's the end of him. He's going to keep playing. So uh, might not be every single day, but. I, like I still expect him to be on the postseason roster. I still expect him to be a part of this team one way or another. So there's still some time for, for some redemption and some moments. And as we know with Yankees fans, all it takes is a couple of those and they'll be right back in.
as they were at the beginning of the season, where they were like, this guy's perfect. Oh, he's a dog, blah, blah, blah. We're a bunch of dogs. Like, that was all Alex Verdugo. Everyone was so excited about it. So it, it, the season but, basically has unfolded exactly as we expected. And but now no, we will see. But no, that, yeah. I want to push back against what you just said, because okay, yeah. if I had told you that Verdugo would have been this bad, mm. I That's would have true. predicted that he would have done something immature and stupid that sure, would have alienated sure. himself within the room and no. to the fan base. Granted, yeah. he has played very poorly and there have been yeah. a moment, there's been a moment or two, but like I would have foreseen this exploding if he had been playing poorly. We're usually true. For players like him. It's like, oh, if they're playing well, everything's fine. He's not been playing well. And yet he really has genuinely ingratiated himself within that room. That's in true. a way no, that I necessarily wasn't expecting. That's totally fair. But the and other that doesn't thing win ball games. That doesn't win no, ball games. No. But it, and it is again, just an element. And again, like while I think we were underwhelmed by the addition. You kind of thought you know what you were getting in him just strictly on the field. It, there was limited upside, but he has basically been the exact same hitter for multiple years in a row now. So the fact that it had gotten so bad was also a little bit strange. Um, but but yeah, I mean, now maybe he can, he can bounce back to a, a little bit more of a of a helpful player as opposed to an active uh, de- detracting force on the, at the bottom of the lineup. So the other thing I feel like I really missed is stays in New York is the Mets. Now, the Mets were rolling okay. in good before I went dark, but they've yeah. continued it. And they're now a game yeah. up over the Braves. Now, yeah. I, you know, am constantly locked into hypebeast.com. And that's usually oh. that's how I get my Mets news, or at least it was over the during this hiatus. <laughs> and I'm, I'm reading a headline that says New Balance reveals signature collection with New York Mets Francisco Lindor. Oh, Lindor, not not Huascar Brazabon. No, I was expecting nothing the Brazabon Bra- line to drop. Nothing about Brazabon. Not in on here. Hypebeast. It, not on Hypebeast.com. Okay. All right. Well, that's a little disappointing, but that is exciting news. Uh, I don't know if that's the most important thing involving Francisco Lindor this week, but um, t- do, you, do you want to tell me anything else more about that? I, I You have more of a fashion sense than I do. Uh, is this... Well, why is this? What is the point? What, why now? Is there, a, is there a cause behind it? Is he... Yeah, is he, okay. yeah, there is a cause. The yep. cause is called looking great. <laughs> okay. The collaboration. What are, what are the This isn't like this is like off the field, right? This isn't like cleats or like this isn't. This is off the field. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The collection features a range of versatile pieces, including a sleek jacket, a pullover fleece, cargo style pants that convert into shorts, and a signature T-shirt emblazon with Lindor's number twelve. Time out. Cargo style pants that convert into shorts is some middle school ish. That's amazing. <laughs> he's got the tearaway shorts on the. Yeah, he's well, he's ready to do some break dancing. Uh, is really what that makes me think of. Um, These are called Lindor convertible cargo pants. Is this already available for sale or is this are these going to be like supreme, like limited edition? Like, nope, there's only going to be buy- 17 of them. You can buy the convertible cargo pant right now. This is not an ad <laughs> on newbalance.com in size New medium. Balance. Are you medium or large for convertible car? Like when you were a convertible That's a cargo good question. pant? I don't are you a medium or I, large? I don't know the last time I wore cargo pants, so I'd have to maybe get yeah. it fitted at my local New Balance store. So you can get that for a very reasonable 169.99. Um mm. there mm, are yeah. What else is on here? There's a bunch of cleats. There's a very cool fleece. Actually, this fleece is something I would wear, if we're going to be honest. Um, The t-shirts I don't need. T-shirts are not for me. And then there's a flat version, like a turf version of the shoe that I I like. But it's it's interesting. Lindor is kind of known for his like flashy colors. And a lot of this is pretty earth toned. Oh, okay. Well, I would say I think you you get the (laughs) you get the fleece. And yeah. uh, you roll into the Mets clubhouse in October. You're like, yo, Frankie, <laughs> how am I looking? <laughs> I was shopping for wedding clothing and ran into uh, ran into a boss and stumbled upon. I was like, I like this shirt. And then it was the Shohei Otani <laughs> boss collection. And it on the back, yes. it like had a big Otani thing. And I was like, I can't mm-hmm. wear that to my wedding. Yeah, probably um, not. But he's continued to play well uh, on the field. Yeah. He sure has, and he had a big moment. I will just combine this with the other uh, big story from the week that you missed uh, on, I don't remember what day it was, in Toronto, Bowden Francis, who has just been on an unbelievable run since he joined the Blue Jays rotation at the end of July, 
Uh, he had a no hitter again going into the ninth inning, and again for the second time in three or four starts, he allows a home run to the leadoff batter in the ninth. Uh, last time it was Taylor Ward. This time it was Francisco Lindor. And the Mets end up piling on a bunch of runs on the horrific Blue Jays bullpen and winning that game. And the Mets are, have now won 15 out of their last 20. As you mentioned, they have passed Atlanta. Jeff McNeil is out for the year with a broken wrist. So we are going to get Jose Iglesias basically every day at uh, second base. So more oh OMG, the better. So that's exciting. Oh my but God. the interesting thing is... You know, you look at their stats over the last 20 games or so, and it's it's real offensively, it's been Lindor and it's been Jesse Winker and it's been Vientos. We'll talk about him a little bit more later. Um, Pete's been OK, but like Nimmo, not hitting well right now. JD, not hitting well right now. Alvarez, Marte, not hitting well right now. But the pitching has certainly stepped up a lot more. What Sean Manaya has been doing lately, he's been one of the best pitchers in baseball over the last month. They're finally starting to have some success on the mound and enough outs out of the bullpen. You know, our friend Ryan Stanek has certainly looked a lot better recently. Reed Garrett is back to looking what he looked like over the first couple months. Tyler McGill has looked good in, in three starts. Um, that's what has really kind of propelled this this run past Atlanta, uh, which is which is pretty impressive. And and now, as I mentioned, you know, their, their playoff odds have surpassed Atlanta and we know they still have that series looming uh, towards the end of the season. But the Mets schedule, I believe they have seven games with the Phillies coming up, which is those are the two teams, hottest teams of baseball. Those are the two teams that have won eight of their last 10. And I believe that is the next series. They go to Philadelphia starting this weekend. Then they have the Nationals and then they have four games at home against Philadelphia. So, uh, yeah, the Mets, the Mets, these are these are big time, big time games. And they're they're certainly uh, making sure that that we are going to have a very, very interesting last few weeks for this final uh, spot here. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time in Queens next week, I think, with the Nats in town and the Phillies in town. I'm happy for the Mets. I, I, I'm just glad that we have this coming down to the wire. Jordan, my last question, uh, and then we'll take a break. With the Mets and the Braves, who has the tiebreaker there? Because in the new playoff format, there is no one-game playoff anymore to get into the postseason. Mm -hmm. So while there is just a one-game gap between these two teams, that really could be two... It is effectively two games or no games, if that makes sense. Well, well, this is why that last series is even better, because as it stands right now, they have... Uh, they're split five and five. Oh, um, So that yes. not only will the standings matter... Uh, in that final series, but they will be playing for the tiebreaker uh, ultimately. So um, that is only makes that last series all the more exciting. So we'll obviously keep an eye on that one. Maybe, maybe one of these AL teams makes it interesting, but the Twins started to turn it around a little bit. Still a little bit worried about them, but they just got Bucks in back. So that's big. Uh, so we will see if they can, they're going to be in Cleveland next week. So I'm excited to see uh, the Twins if they can kind of kind of fend off those other not so great teams and, and make it uninteresting in the American League. But obviously still seeding is very much being, uh, you know, battled for the Orioles now are two games back of the Yankees. So they got some work to do if they still want to, you know, go for the division. But uh, we don't need to talk about the Orioles. It's, uh, I'll, I'll spare you that. We'll push that to next week. All right, Jake, <laughs> let's take a uh, let's take a quick break. And when we return, we are going to talk about the the defending champion Texas Rangers, who will not be likely defending their title this year, but they are still giving us reasons to talk about them. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Baseball Barbacast, Jake Mintz, George Schusterman. Let's get one thing straight before we continue. It is not Kumar Rocker. It is mm. Kumar Rocker. Mm. All right. Yes. Good place cool. to start. Thank you. Uh, Kumar Rocker, the son of an Indian born uh, an Indian born mother a father who was I, who I believe I didn't even know this in the college football hall of fame what and the current defensive line coach for the Tennessee Titans <laughs> I believe he worked for the Eagles uh, when we interviewed him a few years ago but his father Tracy Rocker and Kamar Rocker was one of the most famous college pitchers we've ever seen at Vanderbilt, he was a very highly touted high schooler in Georgia. He did not sign because he wanted to go to Vanderbilt and get even better, and that he did. He had one of the greatest freshman seasons we've ever seen. He had a 19-strikeout no-hitter against Duke in the postseason. He won the College World Series, and then things started to go very wrong. 
Uh, he was drafted by the Mets in 2021. They chose to not sign him because they did not agree with what his medical situation was. They, his, him and their Rockers agent, Scott Boris, there was a disagreement about the medical situation. The Mets did not want to give him the bonus uh, commensurate with his draft slot. And so they decided, sorry, we're not signing you. It was a whole mess. And that sent him out into the wilderness because at that point he could not go back to Vanderbilt. So instead, he pitched indie ball for a year, just a few starts, and then a shocking move on draft night 2022, the Rangers select him third overall, third overall pick, which because he had not really pitched much and because of the injury question marks was a shocking thing. I think we knew he was going to get drafted again, but that was a shocking moment uh, when the Rangers took him third overall. And then unfortunately... Some of the fears about his medical quickly ended up being true as he ended up needing Tommy John surgery at the beginning of last season. And that put him off the radar because he really just hadn't pitched very much in pro ball. And then he hadn't pitched in college in multiple seasons. And it was just like, what is Kamar Rocker? What is this guy? He comes back this year and was just immediately as good as he's ever looked. And that was both not in theory, it was still in there. And it was like, okay, great. He just has to get healthy. But for how good he looked, it was like, oh, my gosh, like there was still a delay to even believe what we were seeing. And because we didn't think that he was going to come to the big leagues this year because the Rangers are not playing for anything. I was like, all right, well, we're going to have some really interesting conversations going into next season. You know, he's going to be competing for a spot. Instead, they call him up and he debuts last night and he was absolutely as advertised because what Kamar Rocker is is someone that yes he throws hard like all the other good starting pitching prospects he was you know up to 97 98 last night but his slider is already as it was in college but now it's seemingly even better uh it is already one of the best pitches in the world there is data to back that up the visual experience of watching it certainly backs it up and yes the mariners lineup in seattle is a nice first assignment however he absolutely lived up to the hype last night, and I am so excited already looking forward to uh, to watching him again uh, in a few days. There's really a couple different ways to evaluate a pitch, right? Um, one is how it looks and how the hitters react to it, right? Which, in a way, is actually the most important thing, how hitters respond to any given pitch, because if they look lost and the pitch has mediocre movement profile like who cares like hitters aren't hitting it that's what's most important right that tracks go watch some of the swings against rockers slider last night and watch the movement of the pitch itself and you're like oh yeah the next thing is you know the data of the pitch the velocity the movement the spin that the release all that stuff same thing there and the last one is just the stats of of what the pitch is doing what it's getting from hitters how it's performing swing and miss you know chase rate, things like that. That also checks out. And I actually want to talk about chase rate specifically with Rocker. It, that slider he was throwing last night was so utterly devastating. Typically, for a right-handed pitcher, the slider is not always a most effective pitch because a left-handed hitter, sorry, specifically against lefties, right? A right-handed slider is not effective usually against left-handed hitters because they're just seeing the pitch for so long, right? Uh, Same-sided hitters, the angle's harder, there's more swing and miss on pitches outside the zone. Right on left, it's easy to see it, and to get swings and misses, you really have to get the ball, the slider, under the hitter's hands, kind of back-footing them. The easiest visual to think about is Chris Sale, a left-handed pitcher, throwing his slider to the back foot of a righty. Yeah, for whatever Andrew reason. Miller. Two Andrew was Miller. one, but that so those are like the best of the best that you have to yes. be that good for it to really work that well. You have to be that good. And it's usually a better weapon for lefties against righties than it is for righties against lefties for whatever reason. OK, mm -hmm. last night, Rocker had more swings and misses on out of the zone sliders against lefties than any pitcher in baseball this year. He threw four innings. <laughs> four right. innings he got right. 10 swings and misses outside the zone from opposite handed hitters now i know that sounds like i'm pulling a lot of different levers on mm -hmm. the baseball savant button you know and i said it's like a, a kirkjian bit 
where I'm like, <laughs> oh, if you, you know, it's raining in, on a oh, Tuesday I, in March. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. I get that. Swings and misses, sliders outside the zone. That's a kind of a big chunk of life on the mound. So the reason that I think this is significant, obviously, is a lot of the conversation with Rocker, especially in college, was what's the third pitch, right? We understand that this guy throws 97. We understand that the slider is dynamite, but how's he going to get left-handed hitters out? He's going to need a change up or a curveball or some other offering that changes the perspective. Slider might be okay. There are sliders from righties that work against lefties. Spencer Striders is a good example, right? Like, it's pretty good. If the pitch is good enough, you might not need something else. Now, I'm not saying that Kamar Rocker is Spencer Strider, and I still think that there are reasons to be somewhat skeptical about him moving forward. How does the league adjust to this pitch, et cetera, et cetera. What I really want to get across, though, is what he was throwing last night was special. was straight yep. up special. 100%. And, you know, he threw it more than any other pitch last night. And But that speaks to it because part of the reason why the stat you just said is the, is the factor is that there's just there's not many that feel confident enough to even try to throw that many right-handed sliders to left-handed hitters. Uh, and so in that sense, you're not, whereas Rocker was like, hell yeah, it's obviously my best pitch, so I'm just going to keep, you know, torturing Jorge Polanco with it. Now, I think what's interesting, the rest of the outing, I mean, seven strikeouts, like he worked his way out of immediate first and third with no outs in the first inning. I think that the questions with him, now again, he's pitched so little since he came back. So it's ridiculous to be harsh in grading his some of the the, the the intricacies of his pitching because he he looked great. So that that caveat is very important. But the questions will be both what fastball does he trust the most from both the command and swing and miss perspective? Because you could argue that this he was throwing both a four seamer and a two seamer, and the four seamer was not performing as well as the two seamer uh, at times, and the command was was also not awesome. Uh, at times, and that's that's part of why, but which is to be expected. Wrote both just some bad misses, and then also just maybe missing some spots. Um, so, how much swing and miss he can get with the fastball is still going to be an important part of his his profile. And then he did throw a couple changeups, and and we will see because ultimately, while maybe he doesn't need it, if he can if he can develop that, now we are talking about someone that becomes very 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 difficult uh, to game plan for because that that's going to be the challenge is. Sure, there are Spencer Striders out there that can go up there with two pitches and say, sorry, good luck. These are two of the best pitches in the world. Um, but usually, if, if you're going to go up there throwing, you know, 45% sliders, it, that that is, it's going to be hard to, it's eventually hitters are going to start to, to figure that out. It doesn't mean they're, they're going to start crushing you, but they're at least going to be able to wait it out uh, more often. So, again... These are, is literally his first start. He made, I think, seven starts in the minors before he got called up here. That's coming off of surgery. All of this is incredibly encouraging. Once he's built up, the workload gets up. All of these things you have to just be so excited about. And it's part of why, as we kind of spin this to the guy who's pitching for the Rangers tonight, we can start thinking about the Rangers in maybe a slightly different way going into next year because there are a lot of questions about this roster and where they go from here after this very dis disappointing title defense. But this is a, a immediately the makings of a, of a franchise anchor for years to come and for a rotation that going into next year had all these old guys with injury concerns. This is very, very encouraging. This is very, very, very a huge deal, especially for a, a team that has really struggled to develop homegrown starting pitching. That's why they had to go out and buy all these other famous guys is because they were failing to develop the Kumar Rockers uh, of the world. And we're, we're still waiting to see what, what to make of Jack Leiter, right? He's still someone that has a ton to prove. Um, but that's another part of it, which is both exciting and, and why any kind of encouraging sign from Rockers is such a big deal. I mean, the upside here is outstanding. And that's something I want to really mention. Like, why are Jake and Jordan spending 12 to 15 minutes talking about a debuting pitcher on a team that's irrelevant in mid-September? And the answer is because Kamar Rocker could be a star, a legit star. I mean, he when you watch him pitch, it's electric when he's going. When he was in college, that 19 strikeout outing, no hitter against... Duke in a super regional was all time. And when you talk about the Paul Skeenses of the world, Steven Strasburg, Garrett Cole, the pitchers that go from dominance at the college level to the pros and stay famous all time, 
Rocker was on that path. Like he was on that track. And then he got sidetracked a little bit for a variety of different reasons. And I think this is just a reminder of what's in there. Yep. This is a guy who has the chance to be really special. I think what made me most feel most encouraged about last night is the fallback plan now is legit. I mean, hmm. worst case, you put this guy in the pen and you would have him rip out 65% sliders. Right. And he's a top 10 reliever in the world. Because, you know what I mean? That's yeah. That and, works in there. Yeah. And and that's the thing, because with all the injuries and the surgery, we just didn't know what the stuff was going to be like when he came back. And there's no question about that anymore. Absolutely none whatsoever. He is he already clearly has some of the best stuff on the planet. And so where it goes from here, there's a lot of refining to do. There's a lot of workload to do. There's a lot of stuff to long way to go. Um, But that is why it is so exciting. Now, the other exciting thing is that tonight the Rangers will throw out another guy with decent stuff. And that is Jacob DeGrom. And Jacob DeGrom, uh, another thing, okay, whatever, Rangers don't matter. Uh, Even early in the season when it seemed like this Rangers season was going haywire, looking forward to the DeGrom return was going to be important because he is one of the most important pitchers of of a generation. Because of the heights that he reached, because of the level of dominance that we saw from him, this is someone who won back-to-back Cy Youngs in 2018 and 2019, but... Before the latest string of injuries that really cost him his last two years in New York and then ultimately shortened his the beginning of his stint in Texas, I I guess I didn't mention this when I was doing the Class A uh, story. I mentioned Craig Kimbrell. You know, you're doing all these these stat head searches and you're looking, oh, you know, lowest OPS allowed and, you know, toughest to hit and lowest whip and all these things. Jacob DeGrom's 2021 is... I mean, basically the greatest 15 start run we've almost ever seen from a starting pitcher. <laughs> um, and, and uh, you know, since then, it's just been stop and start, stop and start, stop and start, stop and start, stop and start up. Okay, finally going to have a second Tommy John surgery at age 35. And so now that we finally arrived at his return, he is 36 now. He's making a bunch of money for this Rangers team moving forward. He is so important if they're going to get back to being contenders. How he looks is is just as important, if not more important, than what Kamar Rocker did last night. And so we'll react to it next week because he will pitch tonight against Seattle. So I don't know if we need to go much longer on that, but it is a huge, huge, huge deal. What is the next chapter of Jacob DeGrom's career? Because for three years, it was just stop and start. Oh, okay, okay, okay. The hope is you got the surgery, you came back. Now let's see what you got. And I am very excited to see. I am looking at this through a different lens. Okay. I don't personally give two Langfords about what the Grom tonight means for the Rangers next season and the year later. Rangers fans should care and the rain like AL West mm-hmm. fans should care, whatever. I want to watch Jacob DeGrom throw that ball. Mm. When he yeah. is on a mound, he is must see T feet. Simply put because we when we talk about DeGrom the concept we get frustrated because of how little he pitches compared to the money and the hype and the name and all that stuff but when he's on the bump it's dynamite and I would encourage people to carve some time to watch Jacob DeGrom pitch because you never know the next time you'll get to see but, it But again. that's, so that's kind of what I'm getting at though, is that like, I don't know if I have that, fe- like, I guess I have to still have that feeling because of the last few years, but he had surgery. He did a full rehab, you know, that doesn't mean it's fixed forever, but like for the last three years before, it was like, will he get surgery? Will he not? Will he get surgery? Will he not? Will he get surgery? Will he not? That's, it was, that was, that was for yeah. three years, for four no. years, really, right? No. So I'm, I'm not saying he's fixed. I, th- what you're describing is how I feel about Scherzer, who's pitching on Saturday. Okay, Scherzer is the one where I'm just like, every time he goes out there, I just don't know because there's just so many things that he's dealing with that are just cropping up in extreme ways that I don't know. But Degrom finally did the thing that we were hoping he would avoid, but that he actually did 
the, the that that so it's not a guarantee i know that and to your point i still agree we should not take it for granted when he takes the mound that's for sure but i that's why it's like all right maybe he's just back in our lives at full strength that would be a massive deal for the whole sport let alone the rangers um and that's that's what is what i'm curious about over these next i guess two weeks if i don't know how they're not gonna let him throw 150 pitches but yeah he's 36 and i think that any 36 year old pitcher the narrative is wow well, i gotta enjoy this before it all falls apart and I think, yes, DeGrom got sur- elbow surgery and he's that is in some ways behind him. This dude could, you know, slip on a banana peel and, you know, screw up. Yeah, his sure. Like this sure. is someone but who has they- had <laughs> so many weird injuries that have that are unrelated to the elbow over the years. And I think that yeah, yeah. it is it is unfair to to say, oh, he's gonna be fine. Like I just don't I, if well, Jacob DeGrom uh, that- got hurt in three starts, I would not be shocked. No, okay, sure, fine. But, you know, the Rangers did give him 100, however many millions of dollars at age 35 with all those issues because they expect him to pitch for four or yeah. five seasons. So that that is uh, that is a bet that we will see how it actually pays off. And yeah, Scherzer is a whole other thing. But the other thing with the ground, too, is they won all six of his starts last year before he went down, and they don't make the postseason without those. So, <laughs> you know, you could say he certainly hasn't maybe been worth the however many millions, 80 million he's made over the last two seasons, but it'll be nice. Uh, to have him back for sure as of right now he's in the patrick corbin we paid how much for this category (laughs) where you get what you paid for in a roundabout way all right let's take a quick break when we get back we'll do a beautiful elongated good bad ugla you know how this goes a week happened and we will talk about it within the context of the good the bad and the ugly one thing good one thing bad and one thing that reminds us of dan ugla mr schusterman you start us off. Uh, my good this week is a Eugenio Suarez, who has quietly been just an absolute force for the Arizona Diamondbacks over the last few weeks. Now, I did mention this on the pod earlier this season because he had a massive July. And then he kind of went cold again in August, or at least the beginning of August. And now he is back to just otherworldly levels uh, over the last eh, three uh, odd weeks or so. Eugenio Suarez uh, over his last 25 games hitting 367, 407, 776. This is a guy who has played basically every single game at third base for the Arizona Diamondbacks. And remember, they took advantage of this embarrassing salary dump from the Seattle Mariners. And they were like, sure, we'll take we'll take a, an everyday third baseman Come play good defense, good vibes. We're not we're not counting on getting, you know, all-star Gino. We just need him to come in and be just fine. And he has been more than that. He has been outstanding, one of the best hitters in baseball recently. He's having a great time. And also, like, that is when we talk about the Diamondbacks big picture, that is a huge upgrade from what they had last year at third base. Huge, huge upgrade res- with respect to Evan Longoria's career, right? This is a huge deal. So when you think about why the Diamondbacks are not going to be considered, you know, this this big underdog going into this postseason, Suarez is a big part of that. And so I, I think that I'm excited for him to get uh, a lot more attention, you know, entering uh, October because he has been truly marvelous. And he's, he's one of my favorite players and, and people in the game. At the end of last year, like during the World Series, there was a conversation I had with someone that went, is a team playing Emmanuel Rivera and Evan Longoria at third base? base really going to win the 2023 world series the answer almost. was no but it was <laughs> no. almost it was so all awfully awfully close so uh gino uh, an absolute legend he is good uh what is your good this week caitlin clark took some hacks indiana fever posting this video of caitlin at the indianapolis indians game the triple a affiliate for the pittsburgh pirates your old neck of the woods and the reason i bring this up is because we so often see NBA players taking hacks at games. And so often these NBA players are bad at it. They are abysmal at it because the size of their body and their limbs and their specific type of athleticism does not lend itself well to hitting a baseball. So much of being basketball is about being big and taking up space. In baseball, you're almost trying to contract everything within a box and be powerful within a small space. Caitlin, in this video, (laughs) is asked by one of her teammates, is that bad heavy? She goes, yes. Swings it, rips one off the 
back of the cage, walks out. Athletes are ridiculous people. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is a very impressive swing. It seems like at the very beginning of the video, she picks up a bat that is not gigantic, maybe being swung by like Malcolm Nunez or whoever in AAA. Uh, but then she's clearly using just like an absolute huge i mean this is and and to, to get the bat speed to connect this and look how far back from the from the plane she's standing like it's that adjustment crazy. to know where exactly to, it was yeah uh caitlin clark very good at both what she does and apparently at what other people do as well i would like videos of every professional athlete from every other sport yes. doing this i think yes. we should onboard you know like in media day for the sacramento kings we should be making De'Aaron Fox take swings off a and, tee. And, and here's the thing. I think this is so important because when you hear the the common trope of, oh, what's the hardest thing you do in sports? Right, hit a baseball. Oh, these other athletes would have no chance. Okay, that's true. But I don't need them to actually take batting practice. I just I just need to see the swing on the tee. I'm not asking you to step in there against 95. I just want to know what it looks like when you're either you know hitting soft toss or against the tee. And uh, this is a very encouraging showing. Uh, from Caitlin Clark. Um, so what a surprise. She's good at a lot of things. Uh, let's go to bad. My bad, uh, my bad this week is whatever is still going on behind the scenes involving getting ready for Major League Baseball to happen in Sacramento, California. Now, again, I want to be a little bit careful here because when we talk about this and we talk about how bad of an idea this might be to play Major League Baseball in Sacramento, this is not a reflection of Sacramento, the city or the people that live there or the fans that are maybe looking forward to having Major League Baseball in their backyard. And honestly, we can even put aside the part about how horrible this is for Oakland. We've done that a million times. That's all true, right? But the reason this has come up this week is because Scott Boris, uh, you know about him, has given an interview. Now, granted, we understand that the Scott Boris perspective is is going to be extreme in some cases, but this is very relevant because basically while the negotiations are happening about what it is going to look like for Major League to happen at Sutter Health Ballpark in Sacramento, a, a AAA ballpark, Scott Boris has basically talked about how this is not, we, we are not feeling good about this and i we don't think that this should happen talking about how the heat it's basically the, the main thing is not just the facilities of uh, the major league clubhouse and all these things that are going to in theory be built ahead of next season but the heat notably was like the hottest july on record in sacramento combined with the turf that is being used at that facility is not particularly conducive to player safety and so scott boris has, has just basically given an interview talking about how like this is not good and this needs to be resolved and they are not actually resolving it now the mlb puts out a statement um it is a certainty that the a's will play their 2025 season in sacramento as planned mlb is continuing to work productively with the mlbpa on the details of the transition i just think this is interesting and the reason why i'm putting this into bad and we're going to keep covering this is because like the number of times we felt like we've reached a conclusion not conclusion but a resolution to the story and the number of times we've had to come back and be like hey wait a minute this is still not figured out is so screwed up and so crappy and so for this A's team, for these A's players, for the Lawrence Butlers of the world who are playing their ass off and actually competing for an A's team that might not stink next season. Like, Where am I going to live? Like this is so bad that we are still doing. And not, not that this is surprising because we knew it was unsettled when this was first announced. But being reminded of this and how messy this is, is just is just so not good to the point where there are still people going out there and be like, well, they might still end up back in the Coliseum is I don't think that's going to happen, but it's bad. It's definitely bad. So anyway, there you go. We're getting close to it. Uh, you know, what's bad for me, Jordan, is a yeah. story that we got yesterday. I'm just going to read from the ESPN report from Kyle McDaniel, Jeff Passon sources. Twins cut minor league catcher Derek Bender for tipping pitches. Now, before we continue. We have met Derek Bender. Derek right. Bender, uh, who was drafted this year by the Twins out of Coastal Carolina in July, six round pick, slugging catcher. Um, well, catching DH, is a relevant part of this story. That's for sure. Uh, Derek, <laughs> it, in our interactions with him, was nothing but an utter delight. However, this story does not exactly paint him 
in the best light I will now read. The Minnesota Twins released minor league catcher Derek Bender on Thursday after he told opposing hitters the types of pitches that were coming to the plate during at-bats in the game last week that eliminated his team from playoff contention, sources told ESPN. The other notable nugget here, I would say, is this following sense. Bender had told teammates he wanted the season to be over, according to sources. Bad. So just Bad. to just Bad. to explain just to explain what happened here, very very in simple terms, Derek Bender was catching. He knew what pitches were coming. Obviously, he He's wanted his team. This is the story that is being told that his he did not want to win and continue to play baseball for Fort Myers this season. He wanted the season to end, and with the season on the line, he told the opposing hitters what's coming, and so they could they scored a bunch of runs, they win the game. Lakeland wins the game. Their season is continues. They get no to playoffs. keep playing. And Fort Myers uh, no longer uh, plays anymore. The Lakeland players apparently told the coaches, uh, hey, that was weird. What was that about? And their coaches told Fort Myers, the Twins organization. And now here we are. They release him. Uh, Derek Bander, again, this is a legitimate prospect. They gave him uh, $300,000, $400,000, I believe, in the sixth round. Um, and this is just, this is a, a very sad story, honestly. I mean, it's it's funny because it's like, oh my god, what 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 is this? How is this happening? And, but really, what it is is what makes sense is the very basic fact. Let's talk about something very simple. Yeah, there are minor leaguers at the end of a long season who are like, I can't wait to go home. That's and true. His in the big is longer than a lot of people <laughs> because he played college baseball this year, and that season starts in. That's early true. February. That's true. That's okay. true. That's true. However, he did only play, you know, 20 games in, in Pro Bowl. But that's true. As far as time, commitment, playing baseball, that's true. That's a good point. Um, so the notion that a player would maybe want the season to end is not completely unheard of. So let's just that's, put that no, out there. Not even that. That is yeah. something that many players on many teams yeah. at many levels feel. I had a teammate yeah. who will remain unnamed who once poked holes in our tarp <laughs> because they didn't want to play the next day. Right. So, okay, that's that's closer to over time, but whatever. But the sentiment of the baseball season is long. I'm tired. I want to go home. That is a thing that that we, you hear that is not uncommon, right? Sure, we can talk about the, and we are going to get to this, the premise of all these guys are trying their best. They, they're And that's all true, right? But the, the, the basic reality of one, that's fine. However, however, when you are actively not trying your best and then actively hurting your teammates, if you want to go up there and swing at the first pitch and ground out every time, no one's going to notice. No, no one will. You could do that. That's fine. I'm sure that's happened. I'm sure I'm it's confident simple. that's happened, right? It's this simple. It's this simple. Hundreds and hundreds of players who wanted to go home have not done this. <laughs> It's yeah. that simple to yeah. me. And right. I'm sure that there's more to the story. And I'm curious to see if Derek Bender, kind of what his angle on this is and what he says. Derek Bender is someone who is pretty well liked within the college baseball world. And I would say that the bottom line here is if you don't want to be there, okay, fake an injury. Suck. D don't, don't, don't. Don't throw your teammate. Don't you know ruin your teammates' efforts at advancing their careers. Right? It's it's Bingo. to me. It's, it's it's that it's it's that simple. Yes. And listen, if if Derek Bender got into Pro Bowl and realized I don't like this very much, that's that's his prerogative. You know, sure. I'm not going to paint him as a terrible person for for realizing that. Um, but that is what is obviously extremely problematic here and and upsetting and uh, disappointing. And that's kind of what that is. I would say. I will not tell specifics. Uh, however, this did once happen to me while I was pitching. And <laughs> it is a hilarious feeling in the moment when you realize it's going on and that your catcher is selling you out, Wh whether it's like yeah. a showcase context or a practice context, right. like whatever it is. It's super funny and horrifying because you just don't like what? Like, it doesn't matter. Like you have to either cross your catcher up or just hit your spot or throw a ball. It's just very bizarre. So, yeah, I feel so. bad for his pitcher. Uh, and I think if what the report if the report is true i think they're totally within their rights to release it 
in my opinion. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Because if you are that blatantly, not only are you, of course, actively inhibiting your, your teammates' ability to do their jobs, but um, that it is a blatant demonstration of, of, of not wanting to pursue this. You know, and again, it doesn't make you a bad person if you decide you don't want to, you know, you don't want to play baseball as soon as you did. But from the twins perspective, who are paying you to do that, that's absolutely within their right. Not to mention, of course, you know, how it's just a poor choice of character, I would say. You're not making right? friends with this decision. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that definitely qualifies as bad. Uh, well, let's go to Ugla. Um, my Ugla this week is the Miami Marlins, who are about to set a major league record. What major league record do you think they're about to set, Jake? The most starting pitchers used in a season. Um, that might be true. They have already set the record for most pitchers used in a season. And with their next appearance for one of the couple pitchers they just called up and claimed, Jeff Lindgren and Michael Peterson, they will set the record for most pitchers Total players used in a major league season. Clap it up. Clap it up. Snapping Peter Bendix, the roster churn king. This is kind of what this season was always heading towards. Uh, Craig Mish putting this on my radar. And this is a record I became familiar with because the record initially was set by the 2019 Mariners. And that was the season that was just screamed what the kind of season the Marlins are having. Not maybe quite as extreme, but boy, were they going through players. Now, that record was tied again, 69 total players used in 2021 by the Chicago Cubs, actually, oddly enough. Um, but now the Marlins are set to, to reach uh, number 70. And uh, this is a, a record that just now the way rosters work in the last few years, like we're seeing teams are using a ton of players like that. That is it's become more common for this number to get higher and higher. But just for perspective, <laughs> the White Sox, <laughs> the worst team ever, have only used 62. Uh, the Angels are at 63. And do you want to guess what the fewest number of players uh, used this season is um, and, and who that might be? I'll say it's the Phillies. So, yep. Phillies are a good guess. They're not the answer, but but they are second, tied for second fewest. I would um, say 42. 47. So the Phillies are at 47, Tigers 47, Padres 47, and the Cardinals at 44, so the fewest. So that just gives you kind Maybe of they should sense. have more Cardinals need more <laughs> players. <laughs> That's clearly, clearly the difference. But yes, 43. The Marlins have already said, uh, smashing the, the Mariners record, 42 pitchers used. 2021 Orioles also on this list, for 42 pitchers used, <laughs> which makes sense. Um, but okay. yeah, this this Marlins Sporkle quiz is going to be immaculate. <laughs> My mind goes to what a disaster for the Marlins ownership group because hmm. they're going to have to pay for so many World Series rings. <laughs> because mm. everyone who appears for the team gets a yeah. ring. They're going to have to pay that, for 70 World Series rings this year? That would have been a, a good joke before they were mathematically eliminated. But alas, uh, they, are, <laughs> they are no longer in contention. But Peter Bendix has done exactly what he planned to do. And um, by the way, uh, the, the 69th player that appeared for them and the record-breaking pitcher for them, Lake Backer. Uh, was the, <laughs> the pitcher number 43. Uh, shouts out to the Warhawks of Wisconsin Whitewater. All right, Jake, what is your ugly? This is so up my alley. Mark Viendo said a walk-off home run. He took his shirt off. There were five Hebrew letters on his chest that did not actually spell a word. A bunch of uh, non-Hebrew speakers on the internet tried to deduce what it said. They were very wrong. Uh, then a bunch of Hebrew speakers tried to deduce what it said, and they were also struggling to figure it out because it appears that Mark Vientos has a tattoo on his chest that is Hebrew gibberish. Uh, it says essentially uh, hip hip lopum <laughs> hip lopum. <laughs> that's four, that's how you would say it if you were trying to read it. Yes. Um, uh, hey, pay lamed pay mem right on his chest, and then there's a four and a six under it. Some sleuths uh, did some good work here uh, at, at Ben underscore Yoel found a tweet from Mark Vientos that said Philippians four, six. That's mm. a good 
uh, you know, that thank there's goodness the number Bible is there because otherwise there's no way we'd be able to figure this out. It, it is so not even close to Philippians in Hebrew, um, but it, it literally says hiplopum. <laughs> it just doesn't mean anything on his chest. <laughs> so in Hebrew, there's a couple different things we need to talk about here. First of all, cannot find a story more up our alley. Number two, Mark Fientos. I don't know when you got this tattoo, but my dude, you're on the Mets. There are Jews around. <laughs> Okay. Or in Miami. <laughs> or in Miami, where you're from. There are Jews readily available to QA <laughs> proofread, to yeah. proofread yeah. your tattoo. Yeah. Please, the next time you do it, have someone take a look at it. Okay. So, How, yeah. Uh, however, I was say, oh, okay. Yeah. This is not the first instance of this that we have encountered. <laughs> yes. In our baseball lives. Yes. yes. A player who will remain unnamed. <laughs> Okay, has a tattoo in Hebrew mm -hmm. on their body. Jordan and I were once involved in a conversation with this person. And at the exact same time, we realized that the, their Oops. tattoo yeah. was backwards. Yes, Hebrew so this, this is the key. This is very right important to here. This is what, when okay. I first saw this Viento story, I was like, okay, well, the first instinct, because this has happened to us before, is to read it from left to right. Did you put the Hebrew letters that are supposed to go from right to left from <laughs> left to right? In this case, doesn't seem that way. I don't think so. I, that's what's funny is Mark Fientos, or the tattoo artist, knows that Hebrew reads the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it would say Maplafa, <laughs> and that's further from Philippians. So, so here's the thing, too. Um, there's also precedent of this being uh, executed correctly. If oh, you, recall, you know what he thinks it is? He thinks it's Ha Philippim. Ha Philippim. Him. Oh, but there's no. It's not a men's so feet. It's not how. And also, and it's not it how wouldn't say it. Not how you would say it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Right. Because I saw the pain the llama, and I was like, maybe once I saw the Philippians explanation. But I, I was saying that we've seen Hebrew tattoos, um, done correctly. Um, Yolmer Sanchez has one in the exact same spot as Mark no. Vientos, or is Yolmer's it more? Is in center, the center, center okay. closer to the neck. His his said uh, Hamelech, which means uh, the king, which I assume is a you know allusion to to the man above, um, and not to Yolmer Sanchez himself saying I'm the king. Right, right, I'm him. <laughs> but we've seen Hebrew Capitalized. tattoos like this. Again, it just seems like you know it's like oh, this is interesting script, other language. I guess the same reason you would get you know a, a chinese tattoo or, or script right where it's like and and, and oh, maybe you know there's that it's a more, great conversation starter right and it's more more and I, but i guess in this case uh, here the attempt was more biblical in nature yeah right so you have that connection however as you mentioned you know we we got people that can that can read these if, if you're going to go especially it's not we're not asking you to read a whole you know a whole paragraph here um, and i want to be clear i'm right. pro non-Jews getting Hebrew tattoos. Sure. Okay? Hebrew sure. does not belong. I mean, it, it does in some ways, but <laughs> it, people can there's do ways, this. Yeah, there's ways just, to do this. Just get it's, someone... Because it, like, my instance, understanding story, about tattoos is kind of hard to edit. Right? Permanent. permanent. So if we're going to do that, let's, let's really nail that. Um, and this is a good transition. Time. Yeah. For my ketubah, at yes. my wedding, the Jewish marriage document, <laughs> I had a Hebrew speaker proofread the entire ketubah, the language in it, so that before Good. I put it down on paper, I had it proved right. And we will finish today's episode with a brief wedding-related ugla. Jordan? <laughs> yes. There was a song I was going to walk. I walked down the aisle uh, at my oh, wedding yes. to a song. Okay. Uh, my family who walked before me was supposed to walk down the aisle to a song. Uh, which is actually in Hebrew, believe it or not. I am Jewish. I had a Jewish wedding. Surprise, surprise. And instead of playing that song, the band uh, played She Will Be Loved by Maroon 5 for my family to walk down the aisle to. Uh, at no point... For your family. Was, okay. For my family. Yes, not yes, for me. Yes. I, I for was, my family. Because I remember the song being played at the timing. I couldn't exactly yeah. recall. Okay. At no point during any conversation with the band was Varun 5's She Will Be Loved mentioned, referenced, indicated in any form. It appears 
that this band, when the moment <laughs> they got defaulted, hot, they defaulted. They defaulted to <laughs> "She Will Be Loved" by Maroon do, Five. Do, 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 do. <laughs> so good, so good, so funny. Which uh, is also I probably why to it in I the didn't... car the other day, and yeah. we were like, "This is our song now." <laughs> Well, it's at least your parents' songs. Um, uh, that is really funny. But also, right, like, it is the right default song to not have correct. people be like, what? Right. You know? Like, but as long as it's, fact, as long right. as it wasn't Bruno Mars. I went up to some music <laughs> lovers at the wedding, at the reception, was like, just so you know. Oh, you That was to... not on purpose. Right. You know, okay. I can't That's have people thinking I chose no, no. Maroon 5 on purpose. No, I... Right, right. Yeah, that's fair. Um, otherwise, it seemed like everything went pretty smoothly. Um, yeah. yeah. Ceremony that was, was the beautiful. Biggest, the reception was great. The whole weekend, a lot of fun Friday, Saturday. But this is, that's your, <laughs> that's your one. Yeah. That's good. That's good. You got you to gotta have <laughs> one, one <laughs> little flub. Um, she will be loved. She will be. I'll tell you that about my wife. She will be loved. I was going to say, again, not an ac- not a, no. a bad goal, right? You know, that's no. it's, it's still, I would say that was part of the theme of the weekend for sure. It's not um, like they played We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together. Right. That would have know? been really awkward for sure. For sure. So anyway, uh, any other <laughs> final wedding thoughts uh, before we, we say goodbye? I guess we could look ahead to the weekend here briefly. Um, before uh, we, before thank we you disappear. to the people who listen, who came to the wedding, and to all the people mm. who listen. Who I have yeah. some people. We, we should who, say that. Like, listen, who were like reached out and were like, "Where can I give to your registry?" Please don't do that. If you feel so obliged to give uh, to me and my wife's wedding registry, make a donation uh, in our name. We have uh, donations on our registry to the baseball organization I volunteer with, and to a reproductive rights organization. Uh, please just donate to that instead. Do, I do not need more napkins. Thank yes, you. yes, um, and yeah, and and as, I'm glad you mentioned that, right? Because uh, it sure seemed like a lot of people listened to the show that were at the wedding. A lot yeah, of yeah. people. Let's say I yeah. love, I love listening. I love watching on YouTube. I love all these things. So if you're listening right now, thank you for for coming up and saying hello. Um, obviously, these are people that Jake and I largely already knew and care about, but it is still or- cool because. Because or have convinced someone that we care about to love them. True, true. And and again, for in the earliest editions of our podcast 10 years ago, we just assumed the only people that were listening were the people that would eventually one day be at our weddings. Um, so the fact that there are now other people that were not at the wedding that are also listening is, of course, very humbling, uh, very flattering, and we appreciate it. So if you like the show, tell your friends and relatives about it. Uh, you can leave a rating review. Uh, let us know. We do appreciate the support. Uh, coming up this weekend, we got the Dodgers in Atlanta. That is certainly a big deal as Otani goes for 50-50. As we mentioned, of course, DeGrom is pitching tonight. Orioles in Detroit. We have the Mets at the Phillies uh, is a big one. I'll be a little bit around Tampa Bay uh, at Cleveland. And then Red Sox-Yankees. Uh, Red Sox-Yankees is a big one. Brewers and Diamondbacks play seven times over the next uh, couple weeks. Uh, so that starts this weekend as well. And uh, yeah, those are the main ones. But Dodgers Braves is very, 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 very compelling. And also a four game series that goes all the way to Monday. So that are definitely those are definitely some big games, obviously, for both of those teams. Thank you to Andrew Hartz for producing. You can email us at baseballbarbercast at gmail.com. That's B-A-R-B cast. Hope everyone has a wonderful weekend and we will talk to you all next week.